<laughs> Brian Castro. Give it up for Brian. Hey! 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, <clears throat> thanks for being here this morning. Uh, it's always good to be amongst people whose purpose in life or profession or allied part of our work is helping others stay alive and go home with their bodies and alive. Um, what a wonderful group of people to be with today and this week. My involvement in emergency preparedness goes back a ways. Professionally, I'm an industrial hygienist. I study where the environment meets humans and can cause health issues or physical issues, create problems for us. I've done studies all over this country. I'm also an auditor, uh, an ISO 14001 auditor. I've audited inside and outside the country. And I, I owned an NIH company that was responsible for all federal agency headquarters in DC uh, when 911 happened. You know, I got a, I got a rude awakening to, to emergency preparedness. The morning of 911, I was actually asleep. I had worked the night before, but I did have a technician at FAA headquarters, and I got woke up to a call while this was going on. Interestingly enough, we learned a lot from 911. You know, they say exercises or real events we learn from. And during 911, I mean, the, the first call I got was they evacuated Washington, D.C. They actually, the mayor pushed a button and they evacuated Washington, D.C. But you know what? They had never planned it, and they had never tried it. And you know what happened? It became a huge cluster. The technician that was doing air monitoring at FAA headquarters got his car out from a multi-underground, you know, they got all these underground parking lots at the agencies and stuff, got his car out onto the street to evacuate and hurried up and sat there for six hours because nobody could move. No one ever thought of that before. What are we going to do if we hit the evacuate button? What's going to happen? Well, we found out in D.C. what happens. Everybody just goes nowhere. And it creates more of a problem because now your emergency responders can't get anywhere. Right? Now, let's do a cascade effect. What else happened on 911? Not only did we have transportation problems, not only did we have people in the way of everything that we needed done, not only did we have an overwhelming wave of volunteers show up to the Pentagon. You know, they had to set up crews just to keep volunteers away. So many people were trying to get down there and help. Um, and what about communication? Let's not forget about the communication that took place on 911. There was almost none. The radio systems went down. Every form of communication pretty much went down. People were using messengers to go back and forth. If it was an important message, it was, it was a messenger running it for a while there. So, you know, emergency preparedness you know, we, uh, uh, we like to think of it and, you know, we practice it in our, in our workplace. Um, we, we, we take it seriously, but there's always something to learn. We're always going to learn, no matter whether it's an actual event or it's an exercise, we're going to learn something. And hopefully today, I'm going to share some things from my experience, which we're going to start out a little bit bookish this morning, and I apologize in advance. But we're going to cover a little bit about risk assessment. You know, what kind of things should we be protecting ourselves from? We'll talk about that a little bit and how to decide those things. Just a little bit, because we've got a wonderful presentation later uh, in the summit on that. We'll then get into my experience being first boots on the ground. Professionally, I'm independent. Now, I'm a consultant. I used to own PCM Analytics. My company uh, was there anytime there was an asbestos job or lead or mold or things like that, I was the person they called and I got to deal with entire floors of attorneys in Washington, D.C. I um, also evacuated on the, uh, I was the inside point person for the evacuation of the Interior Department headquarters, which is an entire city block on C Street in D.C. Uh, we had a whole different presentation, but we had a asbestos release during a large-scale abatement, and literally, uh, we had a, uh, an evacuation. We evacuated everyone, and honestly, talk about emergency preparedness. We were in the secretary's office having this big power meeting, and when they finally decided it wasn't safe to be in the building, they, they decided non-essential personnel would go home. You've heard that term more and more since 911. But the essential personnel, the big shots, the folks making the big money, right? They turned a key and these folks went underground, came up from tunnels, 
this isn't good. One Underground came up in other buildings around the area and their phones and their computers are already working at their alternate desks, right? They kept working. The interior department never shut down. Uh, for three days, I didn't sleep. I was awake every hour. We had national power meetings about what was happening during the evacuation. Um, and uh, I did everything they asked me to do except talk to the press. You know, I was like, look, if I'm going to be your inside point person, the last thing you want is for me to come out for a cup of coffee and get hit by the press because it was just everywhere. So I'm going to share a, a, a few things today. I can't share everything. But we'll, we'll start out a little bookish on risk assessment. We'll jump into first boots on the ground, what it's like showing up into a disaster zone. I think they're all from this region, the photos that I selected. And then I'm going to end up with really the, what I think is a, a natural resource right here in North Carolina. I'm going to end up with a presentation on the North Carolina Baptist Men Disaster Relief Ministry. We've got about 12 to 15,000 trained volunteers with certified with badges who are trained in all different disciplines and uh, I'm going to spend uh, several minutes talking about the training and when we deploy how, how that kind of works. So, you know, when it comes to emergency preparedness and disaster response, to kind of blur that line a little bit, because I kind of write both, both sides of it, you know, the role of safety professionals is, is absolutely critical. It's fundamental. It's paramount, right? It's one of the most important roles. And how you see your role in emergency re preparedness can make a difference to people's lives who are around you and or to saving property, right? Emergency preparedness is about us. I like to think about people primarily, but it's also important that after something happens that, that your companies or your agencies, as the case might be, can recover and get back to work, right? Doesn't do any good to have a farm down for six months and the people who work on that farm not getting paid or on unemployment. That doesn't do anybody any good. So um, we'll touch on these topics and more. But this will not be an exhaustive review of everything. Let me put in a disclaimer, right? Everything I say is my own opinion. It's not necessarily rooted in law, although it could be. And uh, I'd be more than happy to get involved and do some reviews with you all. But uh, this is an <coughs> overview. No one's going to come out of here uh, trained to be an emergency preparedness guru from this session. Now, when you get through the end of the conference, that'll probably be a different story. <laughs> Yeah, so I get around a little bit, uh, White House Champions of Change. Uh, my program is a national model of sustained excellence from when I was with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. I was an environmental health and safety officer there, responsible for 160 schools, 650 buildings, 160,000 daily occupants, 1,200 mobile units. Uh, had, had quite a bit going on. I uh, sat on the State Environmental Stewardship Commission uh, recognized by the Secretary of the Environment there. Interestingly enough, in that capacity, I learned that the zoo here was the first environmental steward recognized by the state of uh, North Carolina. It's interesting. Um, I also do presentations for special needs kids. I mean, in sharing information is something I like to do. It's also on an international technical delegation to China. We had folks from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, a few of us from the United States. And we toured the Chinese uh, emergency response hospitals. We went and met with uh, representatives of, uh, of the miners. Uh, we went to the Hong Kong University. We went to the Department of Labor in Hong Kong. And we talked a lot about sharing, right? The stuff that you all do, we were sharing and exchanging that with Chinese company and government leadership. Um, and it was a really interesting experience to see how their approach, right? Um, again, different presentation, but when we went through a linen mill, for instance, you know, can you imagine the machine guarding they had in the linen mills? Anybody in here that works with machine guarding knows it's important. Well, no, no. they didn't have any machine guarding, and we watched people just stick in their hands, like the old movies you see, like when there was child labor in this country, just reaching right in the machines, right? Um, Safety is something we take serious here uh, in America. Today's objectives, I'd like to provide you an overview of emergency preparedness planning and response, a basic framework for emergency preparedness planning, and to foster a broader discussion. I'm not, the point of the presentation, I hope, is so that you all see some things, hear some things, and maybe some light bulbs go off that result in you talking to your boss, 
talking to your wife or husband, talking to your children, maybe talking to a, a, a legislator, maybe talking to the governor, I don't know, whoever you know. But I'm hoping that, that you receive something from this presentation um, of value. Down to basics, right? Most of us are in business in one way or another, whether it's government agency, private sector, schools, whatever it is. But the truth is, if we're not prepared, we're preparing to fail, right? It's a Ben Franklin quote, I'll come back to that. Um, after a natural disaster, right, a business that is not prepared, that doesn't have its contingency plan, of which emergency preparedness is important, 40% of small businesses won't open. I mean, just right off the bat. People just can't <coughs> handle it, right? You, know, you think FEMA's coming writing checks to remake your business whole? No, they're not. They're going to come out and they're going to help some. But I have yet to find anybody that told me the success story, they hit the jackpot with FEMA. It doesn't happen that way, right? A year later, 25% more of the businesses will fail. And finally, after three years, 75% of businesses without a contingency plan will fail, and the sources are Ready Business Guide. Um, this is legitimate stuff, I'm not just pulling it out, and most of my stuff, the sources are on the slides for you. So, the business case for preparedness is incredibly important. You know, like anything in safety, it's hard for us to show our bosses how many people didn't break a leg this week because of our work. It's, right? It's difficult. We got to come up with metrics. We got to come up with ways of proving that there's value to what we do. And uh, this is just absolutely important. Here's a fairly current slide as of January 30th of this year, <coughs> the federal government has put $1.7 billion into funds for Hurricane Florence. Now that's just one storm, and that response is not complete. I'll have you know, when I responded to Florence, probably 13, 14 communities I helped out with, when I responded to Florence, there was still people recovering from Matthew, right? Lumberton, let's talk about Lumberton, right? I mean. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, homes, businesses got wiped out and we're still in recovery. Right? The more prepared we are, the less the impacts after a catastrophic event will be. Now, from an EHS perspective, and that's really what I'm asking you to do, look at whatever I'm putting up here through an environmental health and safety perspective, right? You know, in a disaster, Routine, stuff that's, that you're just used to being around can become projectiles, they, they, they can spill, they can cause all kinds of problems. You know, in the simple case of some drums, they might be, who knows what's in them. Take your pick, everybody in here has got some drums somewhere. But after a tornado, when those drums end up outside, if they're not properly labeled, depending on the circumstances, you could end up in a situation where a hazardous or where an emergency responder has to go to level A equipment to figure out what's going on with that drum that's really just full of wood chips or something. Who knows? It's very important. So kind of introducing the topic of the EHS role in emergency preparedness, I think HASCOM is a great example. Just knowing, having an inventory of your chemicals. We heard it yesterday. I hope you hear it again. Don't keep your inventory in one place. Hanging on the wall in, uh, uh, in, you know, with your MSD book is great, but if that particular part of the plant's not here tomorrow, that book's not doing anybody any good, right? Have it stored, preferably in a uh, fireproof box, somewhere else so you have an alternate location to find them. You know, things as simple as lead paint, right? Lead paint's not really a disaster issue so much. However, unless you're the person with your face getting in it, or you're the person eating the lead dust or being exposed to it. Um, you know, people know, you know, alligatoring paint, when it's alligatoring, that's often a sign of lead, not necessarily. Red lead, folks think of red lead as being red, but truly it's orange. This was uh, from the Pentagon, that's about 70% lead right there. You would never think so. Um, know your stuff, know your stuff. Whatever it is that you specialize in, whether it, whatever it is, know your stuff. Many times I've had uh, interesting discussions with experts on lead and different, different materials. And when I tell them, did you know that a, a gallon of white lead paint uh, 
there's 17 pounds of lead in it? They, they, no, it's impossible. Can't physically happen. Well, did you know that industrial red lead is 22 pounds of lead per gallon? Oh, can't happen. Uh, arguments for years. I mean, there was one last year on the internet I posted something like that, a picture, and, and man, it, it just created a, a roar, a stir, it can't possibly be. Well, I've got a painting manual from the turn of the last century. And uh, right here it says, a gallon of white lead paint weighs 20 to 22 pounds. If we add three gallons of oil to 100 pounds of paste lead, we have five and three quarters gallon of paint weighing 21 pounds per gallon. I mean, it's that much lead. When, we, when people come out and check lead in your factory, they're talking about milligrams or micrograms of lead. No. On an old farmhouse, there can be a ton of lead on the outside, right? In your industrial plants, on the, old, on the, uh, on the structural steel, there is a lot of lead, and it can be hazardous. You know, is it our number one priority in an emergency? Probably not. But being prepared, having your responders prepared for what hazards are out there is critical. You know, asbestos is another one uh, that we come in on. You know, when a tornado goes through, or a hurricane, or a earthquake, or whatever it is, uh, assessments have to be done. This is a, a basement of an old school. Uh, that some folks had gone into and they didn't realize that there was air cell asbestos, right? Some of the most friable asbestos you can have. Um, you know, back in the day, under buildings, insulators, no offense to any insulators, I love insulators, but insulators would take the old asbestos, rip it off, just throw it on the ground and then repack it, put new asbestos on. That's just the way it was. So under buildings, or in this case, it looks like it just flat out deteriorated. It's a school that's probably likely. But, you know, there's this, all this asbestos in the ground, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's a footprint here where someone had gone in and actually rummaged through this stuff and totally got contaminated by asbestos. When we're responding, we have to be, you know, situational awareness is absolutely critical. Mold, not going to spend a lot of time on mold. Hurricanes, North Carolina, we got mold. We got mold everywhere. Um, interesting things about mold, these are some photo micro photographs I did. Um, what we see at the surface is generally the spores of the mold. But, the, but where the mold really grows is under the surface. These lines, they're like hairs, they're called hyphae. And that's what's really growing. If there's a couch that's got mold on it and you wipe it off, and it looks like it's gone, it's not. You just wiped off the fruiting bodies. The actual growth medium, the actual growth, the body of the mold is actually down inside the couch fabric. Not, I mean, not way deep, but just, you know, kind of almost at surface level. And it's in there growing. Something else to be aware of. Um, climate change. You know, I think we're beyond debating whether it's happening. People, most people, or political parties anyway, agree it's happening. The argument is why it's happening. I don't care why it's happening. I just want to know what it's going to do to me and what it's going to do to us, right? Um, you know, we can't deny the temperature data is not political. It's not skewed. It's not the kind of science that they buy. The thermostat tells you it. I mean, we are getting hotter. Hurricanes are becoming more intense and more frequent. Um, for example, in 2018, at least 224 locations around the world set all-time heat records. That's, that's not a Obama or Trump lie. That's not any, you know, it's not. That's just reality. You know, the temperature at the North Pole was 50 degrees hotter than normal back on February 25th, 2018. I mean, these things are real, and they have impact on us. You know, some, some of the more closer to home, maybe, Pandemic flu, right? Pandemic flu, right now, are we prepared for that? You, you, I watched the news last night. There's a lot of complaining. America <clears throat> is not prepared for another pandemic right now. And it looks like it's getting bad. I mean, China, the numbers are off the hook. I, I saw a map last night with like half the world. It's, it's, like, it's like Africa and South America are the only places that haven't been like hit significantly yet. It's coming. We are going to see a pandemic soon. What about active shooter, right? Oh my gosh, 
right? When we think of emergencies or disasters, interchangeable words, if you, if you will, active shooter, that's a new one. We haven't seen, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s or whatever, we didn't have active shooters show up in schools. Today, it's almost a, you could, you know, who's getting shot today? You could almost ask, right? Who is it? Who's going down? And there's lots of training for active shooter. Anybody had active shooter training in here yet? Yes. Yeah. 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 My kids have had it. It's 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 amazing. And what are we teaching? Right. Right. Um, active shooter. Uh, run if you can. If you can't run, hide. And if you can't hide, fight. Thank you very much. Now you're prepared. Um, Electric grid related losses. Want to talk about a business impact? Oh my gosh, billions and billions of dollars are lost every year because the grid goes down. What happens if the grid goes down and you've got a flood going and you've got, you know, 80 mile an hour winds coming through the area? And of course, fire loss. There are so many things that we could be prepared for. Bring it again closer to home. Here's an example of uh, my own house during Florence. Um, I was responding, uh, I think, around New Bern at the time, and I got a phone call that the little stream, we've got a little stream maybe three feet wide and normally a couple inches deep. There's fish in the spring and stuff, but just a little bit. It had come up, basically become a hundred yard wide river, and uh, not only was the flood, it didn't get to the house I'm up high, I built high, my dad <coughs> taught me to build high, um, but the water came up, and talk about a cascade effect, not only was there a flood, a significant flood in the area, but when, but when the water gets saturated, particularly in this area, trees give out really easy. And I had about an 80 footer come down and literally land on my house. I mean, it, otherwise it looked like a healthy tree, but the root ball was almost nothing. So um, I've, I've, I've been hit myself. Now, don't worry about reading this. Um, but the, the, the government has put together, the federal government, through the Strategic National Risk Assessment, which was conducted in 2011, they came up with high level hazards. What are the most significant hazards that our nation faces? And they broke them up into three categories, which we'll talk again about in a little bit. But natural hazards, technological or accidental, and adversarial or human caused, okay? You know, natural is obvious. You've got perhaps an animal disease outbreak, earthquakes, hurricanes. Here's one for you. Space weather, sunspots. Right, that's on our national preparedness list. Uh, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions. Technological could be biological food contamination that just happened because of a type of technology. A dam failure. I've got some examples of dam failure later in the presentation. Radiological substance. Or how about adversarial human <coughs> cyber attacks? Two of the firms I audited last year were hit by cyber attack. One pretty much lost everything. Uh, but they, de they decided they weren't going to pay. It was called ransomware, right? Uh, one, they, they basically lost it and had to rebuild from their mirror sites or whatever. Uh, the other group paid. And what they got back was some of their data but most of it was garbled garbage. I don't blame you. I wouldn't. I don't think there's any value in paying. You never know what you're going to get. Be prepared and have a backup. Um, but this will be. This is available uh, uh, in the presentation for later. Again, coming back to to Ben, our friend Ben, visited his print shop a couple weeks ago. On break, took the kids up to Philadelphia for a for a trip. Uh, but anyway, by, by failing to prepare, we're preparing to fail. And it's, it's just, it makes so much sense, and it rings true to this day. But, you know, a, a, a question comes up with so many things to be prepared for, whether it's, you know, our drums, our chemicals, whether it's electrical outages, whether it's pandemics, who knows? How can we possibly be prepared for everything, right? And the answer is, probably we can't. No one can be prepared for everything. But we can do some analysis. We can think about what might be. You know, ben took the time to think about it and realized, hey, it might be a good idea to have some buckets with water if there's a fire and have some people ready to throw that bucket on that fire. That was a 
that was a changing moment for our country. What I wanted to talk about, presidential policy directive number eight, which is national preparedness. I'd like to ask, this is very important, please don't, if anybody knows President Trump, please don't tell President Trump that this was signed by Obama. We, we like this. This has done a lot of good for our country and for emergency responders, and we don't want to have to change our emergency preparedness plans if President Trump finds out that Obama signed this. So, okay. But our national preparedness goal is to secure a resilient nation with the capabilities required across the whole community to prevent, yeah, capabilities across the whole community. Preparedness, it's a whole community event. Most of us think of it in our compartment, in our department, in our employer. But preparedness is taking, a, it's happening across your entire community. Your police are involved in it, your fire department's involved in it, your, your hospitals are deeply, deeply involved in it, your sporting arenas are involved in it. It's across the whole community. To prevent, protect, mitigate, respond to, and recover from the threats and hazards that pose, here it is, the greatest risk, right? We can't, it's not possible to be protected against every potential risk. No one in here is, we're not, none of us are protected against everything, right? Anybody can get a cold from sitting next to somebody or whatever. But the greatest, right? And you heard this yesterday too, PPMRRs, prevent, protect, against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from. We've got entire manuals written on this stuff. They're all available through FEMA. But if you want to look into the national level, it's there. Now, I'm kind of curious, just with a show of hands, I'm, uh, and uh, this isn't supposed to be scientific, and I'm not taking notes, and no one else is either. But I'm just curious, what level of preparedness would you classify your workplace? Or if you want to answer for a friend, that's OK, too. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, Anybody feel like not at all, just getting into it? Good. How about starting to plan, just getting started? How about engaged in a planning program? Okay, yep. Advanced preparedness? Oh yeah, that's what we like. I've heard some of the stories from people in this group. I know there's some fantastic programs. Be sure to, be sure to chat during this. If you don't chat with each other, it's a real loss. Preparedness gurus? Okay, answering for a friend, I like that. That's great. Thank you. So, okay, so we're pretty good, pretty rounded group, I think. Based on the national preparedness goal, preparedness has been defined, and you'll find this in the Comprehensive Preparedness Guide, version two. Google it. You'll see that preparedness is defined as actions that involve a combination of planning, resources, training, exercises, and organizing to build, sustain, and improve operational capabilities. Wow, this is the bookish part I told you about. I'm gonna get bookish for just a few slides. Please forgive me. I'll make up with some fun pictures. In <coughs> Preparedness, in business school, they talk about the Deming cycle. Plan, do, check, act. The preparedness cycle is a variation of plan, do, check, act, or the Deming cycle. Plan, organize, train, exercise, evaluate and improve, and go back into planning. It's a cycle. It doesn't stop. We always are improving, right? And we're improving through the process of identifying personnel, training, and equipment needed for a wide range of potential incidents and developing jurisdictional specific plans for delivering capabilities when needed for an incident. This is really federal, but it explains, I think, really clearly what it is when we talk about preparedness. Now, preparedness requires engagement. It, pre it requires people to network, to talk to one another, to understand things. And knowing your stakeholders is critical when it comes to preparedness. Now, whether it's you in your role, or maybe the plant manager, or the risk manager, or the board of directors, or the agency head, somebody needs to be, at some level, involved with the different groups that make up your stakeholders, okay? And your stakeholders can be, um, everybody's stakeholders are different. We have some common stakeholders, but 
that could range from law enforcement, the fire service, hazmat, healthcare, government, administrative, our neighbors, private sector, and more. All these folks have <coughs> impact or could be impacted by what's going on. Now, in the federal program, they do like to, or in basic emergency preparedness, we like to define hazards and threats. Hazards tend to be natural or man-made sources of uh, harm or difficulty. And threats are occurrences, individual or entity actions that has or indicates the potential to harm life. Information operations, blah, blah, blah. That's from our National Infrastructure Protection Plan. Really, when it comes down to it, it's, it's evolved a little bit since then. Most of the time, <coughs> folks will say that a hazard, right, or that a threat is something intended or intentional. That's been my experience. That's what I've seen in the last few years, is that a hazard might be a safety-related issue, whereas a threat is somebody tries to blow up a building. You know, the five big questions, I feel, any preparedness program needs to be prepared to ask, answer, and work towards resolving. So, one, with all the things going on in the world, what do we need to be prepared for? Question number one, right? What do we need to be prepared for? Two, what level of capability do we need to be prepared for, right? Is having one fire truck, if you've got a plant that's up in the mountains and it's a 34 minute drive for the local fire plant, fire department to get there, and you've got one truck, but you do an analysis and it's gonna take three trucks to really address a fire on your plant, is one, is that a good enough capability? What level of capability do we need? What are our current capabilities? What gaps exist? So where do we need to be? Where are we? What is the gap between these two? And how do we fix it? With so many, so many different types of things that we need to be prepared for. Um, <coughs> it's just you know, space weather. Does anybody have space weather in their plan? Right? <laughs> So <clears throat> there's this equation, don't worry about it. It can be written differently, it's done differently by different people. I picked one variation of it that I'm going to share um, for those who haven't seen something like this. But we try to prioritize what we're prepared for, okay? Try to prioritize it. And the basic idea is you identify your threats and hazards. This can be done by plant, by geography, it could be done by department heads, supervisors, um, but you identify your threats and hazards. Now, you also have to talk about, you also identify your vulnerabilities. How vulnerable are you? How likely is it? Let's go back to space, right, space weather. How likely is it that space weather is gonna, you know, knock us out? Should we be more worried about fire or more worried about space weather? And we'll get to that in a second. <coughs> How bad is it going to be if what the threat is actually happens, right? So you do this equation, and that tells you your risk, how much risk there is. ReadyGov Business has this real nice example of how you can work through a hazard vulnerability and risk assessment to identify those areas or those things that you would like to be protected against, okay? Or you would like to be prepared for, let me put it differently, right? So in this column, we'll list those, all those different items. And again, it could be by plant, it could be by building number, it could be by shop or work group. There's a, every, every company can do it the way that works best for them. There's no <laughs> one size fits all. Then we go through and we kind of do a, an analysis. How probable is it? You know, uh, will it impact people? Will it hurt property? Will it impact our operations? Are we gonna have to shut down? Um, you know, and, and we ultimately end up with a ranking, which I should have. And so just to work through this, and this is just one way of doing it, you can use the form any way you want. One example I put on here, we started, these are the main plant, the tank farm, and an administrative building, right? So for the hazards, uh, hazard tornadoes, or a power out, space junk, right? Believe it or not, space junk is listed out there as well. You remember when Challenger, when Challenger exploded, there was hundreds of miles of a debris field in Texas, 
right? One of my guys went down and worked it, where they were picking up remnants um, that could be have hazardous materials, asbestos, body parts, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, so I went through and just worked through this little equation with medium, with low being one, medium being two, and um, high being three, and did the math and came out with tornado is more risky than uh, space junk hitting our tank farm, for instance. So you can do this, and I'm not, I'm not doing a full course. There will be more discussion on this as we, as we go through the uh, summit. But by working through, and I've worked through these many times, and I've worked through where it's one page of risks or threats are identified, and I've done it where it's spreadsheets on a computer, right, where, but again, it's up to every organization to determine what works for them. Now, once you've identified a register of hazards and threats, we need to determine our preparedness targets, right? So we know we want to prepare against, or we, we, want, we know that as one of our measures, we want to evacuate people. So one of our pre measurable preparedness targets could be to train 20 evacuation stewards. As simple as that. We want to evacuate 750 employees within four minutes of the alarm, shelter in place 350 within one minute of the alarm. Whether that works for you or not is not the question. It's just an example of the preparedness <coughs> target. Once we have our targets defined, then we get into the capability gap assessment. Where are our capabilities today and where do they need to be? We figure this out by conducting field exercises, desktop reviews of our existing resources. You can use disaster modeling programs. If you have tanks of methyl ethyl bad stuff, there's modeling programs. You can go online and say we have X pounds or gallons or what have you. And if, it ex if something traumatic happens, how big will the plume be, depending on weather, these types of things. You can do modeling to figure out how extensive it's going to be so that you can know what you need to do to be prepared. So a capability gap assessment is identifying your targets, where you want to be, subtracting out where you already are. So for example, we might want a total of 24 fire stewards to guide our evacuation. Well, right now we only have four. <coughs> so our gap would be 20 stewards. Right? So, right, so based on our capability gap assessment, and I know this is a lot of words, but I'm covering a lot of ground, I could, we could spend all day. We could spend a four-day class just talking about you know, capabilities and gap assessments and all that. I'm trying to crunch it quick because I'm hoping if it'll, it'll spark with someone and you know, two years from now, you'll be making these great presentations on your program. But <clears throat> this is where our resource requests would come in, our capability gaps. If we know that we need 20 stewards, or if we know that we need another tanker truck, or if we know that we have a gap between where we want to be to protect our business, our, our, our home, our school, our property, right? this is where the resource request comes in, where we can write up a budget request and ask for help. And when I say budget request, it's not always just you know internal. FEMA does have, there are grants out there. Many, most of the municipalities are tapping deeply into FEMA grants. But to get those grants, they're going through a procedure very similar to this to identify what those needs are. And I think we can apply the same process to our own budgeting. Uh, you know, back up your requests. Show them why you need the 20 extra people trained. Show them why. Has anybody engaged in a capability gap? Have you, is that something you've been doing in your programs? No? Well, how do you, and so the question becomes, you've got this well-defined plan on paper. How do you know it's going to get you where you need to be? Right? You conduct exercises and all that. And I guess if you're on the mark, you're on the mark. But we can't be prepared for everything. There's always, there's always something out there that we can improve on. So, apologize for that. That was my bookish part, okay? Uh, I just felt it was important to share that information. Now, 
getting into a disaster zone. You, know, you wake up, you get the phone call, 911 just happened, or your variation of that with your employer, your work. You know, getting, getting to work or getting in to respond is a big deal. It can be a very big deal. Um, this photograph on the top right, uh, <coughs> that's the road that made me decide I'm not driving at night into disaster zones. Um, I got a call, uh, 13 communities underwater, uh, need you to get up there and do assessments so we can mobilize resources. Uh, left, got up there, the rain had stopped, uh, but my GPS was a little bit funky and, and it was up in the mountains and I ended up, I ended up on some interesting roads and I'll tell you, I rolled my window down, I'm driving in the truck, man, the river just sounded so loud, you know, the river running by the, by the road there. And it wasn't until the next day that I, you know, that, that I had learned that basically half the road had washed away that night. Um, you know, I'm very grateful and thankful that it, I wasn't there when it happened. Um, or, you know, if your plant is on the other side and there's only, this is the only way to get in, either you're going to the other side of the mountain and coming in the back way if you can, if there is such a way. Or your emergency preparedness plan on, on the large scale, not the micro scale, might require having some boats lined up, right? If, if, if it floods between you and where you got to be, your plant, uh, boats might be essential. It might, it might, you know, you might not need to have them on hand, but you might want to have a vendor on file who you can call in an emergency situation, get some boats over there for whatever purpose. Um, here's an example where across the street there was a, a big lumber yard, and you can see all the, you know, the whole lumber, all the, all the raw wood, not a lumber yard, a mill, big mill, right? All the trees just lifted up, went across the river and landed in this guy's yard, took out his road. And I had mentioned dams. You know, when we think of dams, traditionally we'll think of the big, big, huge dams, uh, maybe Duke Energy dams or dams along the river system. But there's thousands and thousands of smaller dams. Uh, farmers have put them in, for instance, or small communities will have, you know, their little pond is like a feature. It might be six inches deep, but it looks nice. That kind of stuff. Um, they, they wash out regularly. Um, I'll have some more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> Now, um, this one, this was West Virginia, 1,000-year rain event. By the way, I've responded to something like 3,000-year rain events in just the last couple of years in this region. I mean, this, you know, this climate change political thing, I think, is different than the reality of what we, you know, put that to the side. Uh, Florence and Matthew, right, back to back. Dorian, these are just devastating storms. We haven't seen stuff like this before. Now this was just a thousand year rain event, it wasn't a hurricane, right? Um, the orange mark here is showing that the car's been checked. Uh, there's no one dead in the car. Uh, there's one of the houses, I think. You might see it, might be another photograph. There's, here, it might be here. Um, you know, folks, there's a crew that'll go through looking for people, you know, to, to, to rescue and will mark vehicles just in case so we don't have to duplicate efforts. But you know, your trucks, you know, that truck's not going to work today, right? Uh, can you imagine? I mean, I, I do not know the story. I just know what I saw, right? Where did that person go? Who's looking out for the special needs folks? Who's looking out for the people in the senior communities where some of us will be someday, some of our parents, maybe some of us are there now, I don't know. But you know what happened? Uh, it was in Florida. I forget which storm it was, maybe. I don't remember. But you know, folks in the old folks just got left. And several of them died. It just the flood. But getting to work is, in, is, is incredible. It, it's difficult. How are you going to do it? You need to be prepared. <clears throat> Sitting at home, if your role is being part of the emergency response team for your agency or your uh, plant, your school, what have you, it's not going to do much good to call in and say, well, I can't get in because, you know, I got a six foot gap in the road. We've got to think about these things. How do you do it? You might have to drive an extra 60 miles to get two miles, and I've done it. I've, done, I've driven around mountains. I've, uh, I've driven around back, back through, you know, just like cow paths, <laughs> you know, believe it or not, to try to get into some of these places. <clears throat> the devastation, 
I think because we're in North Carolina, I think most of you have probably experienced some of this or seen it. Um, but the devastation, it's, it's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, here, there was a, there were people in the house, in this house, when it was taken by the river. They didn't survive. Um, you know, uh, I don't know what to say. I, you know, the EHS aspects to this are incredible. You know, everyone in here could write a paper or write a report or take some pictures and put a report together about all the hazards of any one of these pictures. The hazards are just phenomenal. And it makes our trade that much more valuable. You know, whether you're an emergency responder or not, you're in the safety field, you know things, you have experience, you've read things, you've said in meetings like this that other people don't get it, they don't understand. So, you know, our profession is, in, you know, and you might be called to step up at some point. You might be called to step up and go outside your comfort zone. Uh, be safe when you do it. And, um, but understand, everybody's going to need help when these things happen. Uh, fires break out a lot of times. Uh, I've seen a, a bunch of, you know, huge rain just went through and then you got your gas station burned down. Or, you know, catastrophic failure of structures. That's also something that we worry about. Uh, you know, when that barn went down, not only, not only did the barn go down, but now you, you could be talking a few hundred thousand chickens dead floating down the river. And that happened, right? We had thousands and thousands of hogs that were killed uh, in Florence, Matthew, you name it. Uh, and they become carcasses and become health and safety related issues. <clears throat> you, you just never know what you're going to run into. This is silt that was deposited by a flood. Uh, the river, uh, the culvert, or the bridge, right, the, a bunch of debris blocked where the water would go under this bridge. It created a dam. And so the entire river, this town, became the river. And about a foot and a half or more of silt was deposited. Um, when I got there, uh, people had already, well, this is a few days in, but at this particular spot, the postmaster was in there. She's, the postmaster was trained. They're trained if, if, if there's a, a moisture event coming, they're to take all the mail they can, get it as high as they can, and then get out. Well, thousand square foot little, little tiny post office, she noticed water at her ankles. She said, a thousand foot, now we're talking maybe 10, 10 bales of mail or something, right? Before she could get it all up, she was chest high in water. The fire department had to come her, get her out of there with a boat. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you prepare? Now, that's not the worst. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not the worst of it. Um, upstream in the river of this particular town, there's a lot of uh, what I call industrial agriculture, large scale farming, lots and lots of animals and a little bit of area. Well, when when sewage ponds, is there a better name for that? I can think of a few, but I'm not going to use them. <laughs> Waste, yeah. So, manure, yeah. The truth is, this sludge, people there, they weren't thinking about it. I grew up on a little horse farm. I know what manure smells like. I moved enough of it myself, okay? I'm telling you, there is so much manure through that town right then and there. You want to talk about bacteria, potential diseases, it's just disgusting. Little kids running around with no shoes on and their shorts, right? Um, there are just so many. Yeah, so just a few assessment considerations when I go into an area, but that you all need to be thinking about, right? Mold, bacteria, mold and bacteria, two separate things, both nasty. Asbestos, carcasses, animal or human, right? Uh, hazmat gases, live animals. You know, snakes, dogs that are freaking out, raccoons that got rabies and are hungry, insects, oh my gosh, uh, the Black River, uh, the Black River, I went down there, it was over, it's way, the mosquitoes, you couldn't get out, of, you know what I'm talking about, you couldn't get out of your car, you'd be covered head to toe, I mean it was scary how many, 
The insects go nuts. Of course, sewage, whether it's floating <laughs> down the river or floating in your front room, right? Energy, most of the time it's gonna be out. Right? Or though, if it's not out, you could have hot lines that are also problems. Again, structural issues. Gas stations themselves have millions of large-scale farming chemical plants, storage, road, I mean, the list, this group, I mean, we could spend all day, all of us, and not list all the hazards, right, that are in this world today. When it comes to personnel health and safety, you know, it's a little bit different in a disaster zone, whether it's before or after or during. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on like, or, or any, because we have a couple presentations coming up on regulatory basis uh, or aspects of um, disaster and, and, and emergency preparedness. But you know, just to give you an idea, you know, folks going in, you, you never know where your employees might have to go or you might have to go. Who's doing the assessment of your plant after there's a flood? Who's going to go into these areas? Who's going to determine if that? Who's going to check the confined spaces? <coughs> right? Who's going to take the gas meter? Who's got the gas meter? Who, did anybody calibrate the gas meter? Right? Not going to do you much good if you haven't calibrated your equipment and you go out and use it. You could be putting somebody to their death. You know that. Don't need to get a little preachy. You know, the mold starts to grow within 24 hours. Uh, you got people uh, tarping roofs that might not be used to doing that kind of work who could get hurt. Uh, again, floods, um, swift water rescue, right? Don't know if anybody's involved in that, but there's another aspect to deal with. Again, electrical lines down, you know, these can be hazards, whether it's inside, outside, on the road. Um, you know, again, when it floods, and the, the, the soils become oversaturated. <laughs> you know, I hate to say it, but I've got 150 pictures that show where one minute it looks like this, the next minute one of them trees just decided to fall. You know, there is a hazard. You know, like I had mentioned, you know, this guy's truck was parked at the time, right? Uh, a group from Tennessee came in. Uh, this was during a Baptist men uh, uh, response. Well, I, was, I was out uh, working with a, a crew from Tennessee. People from all over come to help us, by the way. People from, I mean, Michi I've worked with people in Michigan, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky. They come from everywhere. When we need help, our brothers and sisters respond. And they, trust me, they help. But you can see, a tree decided to come down. Good thing he didn't decide to go out and smoke his uh, pipe or cigarette, you know, at that point in time. Um, this, this photograph, um, over close to uh, Red, Red Springs, um, you can see the tree almost came down, isn't quite, it's leaning on this other tree, and it's, it just wants to take these electric wires out. You know, it just wants to. Uh, tree balls or the roots. I mean, this happened during Matthew, but this was Florence when I drove by. This is not a optical illusion. <laughs> Right? The tree ball is bigger, or the root ball, is bigger than the house. These things can be extremely dangerous. And, you know, and then I just threw in here, just FYI, you know, the volunteers and the people responding, they have issues too. I mean, the, the volunteer who showed up to cook, for instance, right? You got normal hazards associated <coughs> with cooking. But something we found out, a lot of our volunteers, speaking uh, from North Carolina, uh, Baptist men and women, uh, uh, Baptist on Mission, uh, a lot of folks, particularly during Florence, we found um, heat exposure was just knocking people out. Uh, you, folks who might be used to sitting on the couch watching TV or coming to work and sitting at a desk or whatever, and then they end up in a disaster zone, it's hot, it's humid, might not be using a chainsaw, might just be giving away water, right? But try doing that for 12 hours after you've been on the couch most of the last two or three or four years. It makes a difference. We had to develop a program to acclimatize older people to, to working. And another thing we found out is folks were overusing Gatorade. And Gatorade became a hazard. I, I don't take that wrong. Gatorade's a good product. I don't mean that. But if you, oh, if, you, if you use too much of it, it's a hazard in and of itself. You know, disaster uh, waste streams, A, they stay around a little bit longer. Right? I can tell you, when, when the news stopped covering Florence, right, I was driving around 
for months and still seeing situations like this out in front of people's houses. Months, right? Just because the TV quit covering, that doesn't mean that people are all put back together. I mean, we still got people out. I mean, there's, go down to Lumberton, there's still people who don't have their homes, right? We're to, we, it's, 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 it's awful. But waste streams, of course your molds, tanks, I saw a tank, and I don't know what size it was, bigger than a semi, one of those, one of those main uh, propane stations where the tank is like, I don't know, 100 feet long, it's mild, floating down the river, right? Just floating down the river, waiting to hit a big old rock. Um, you know, what's in there? You got tires, some kind of, some kind of chemical cans, and just, you know, you, you don't know. And, it, and it's everything. And not only is it everything, but it's, it's everything these people ever had. It's their pictures, it's their TV, it's, it's, their, it's the flower petals that their granddaughter gave them. It's, it's everything. And not only do responders deal with the actual response, but people too, you know? Uh, Baptist men, and I'll talk more about this later, but we have uh, trained chaplains that'll go out with the crews. And we, we talk about, you know, the stages of grief. All the volunteers are trained in it. Because, you know, you, you might come up on someone and just not think about it, but they've just lost everything they've ever had. Or, or and it's not just adults, the kids. They don't know how to deal with it. Now here's an example where the house got picked up. And luckily, well, I don't know luckily or not, it's definitely going to be condemned now. The house is, you know, 50 yards downstream. It got stopped by some trees there. Otherwise, it would have been further. Probably tore completely apart. But it landed on some trees. You know, here, that's how the water left another house. Um, you know, <coughs> so communities, when we think about emergency preparedness, we think about our immediate role as safety and health, as risk managers, as environmental, as, as, as moms and dads, whatever it is, we think of our immediate role. <clears throat> but really, we're preparing what we're doing right now is part of a much larger program that's happening all over the United States of America at many different levels. I think North Carolina is probably more advanced, especially now with the MESH program. The EP MESH is, uh, I think, uh, something that's, that's going to be very well received all over this state. Uh, we need more people that go through that program and uh, are ready to help their local communities and their employers uh, get ready uh, to minimize. We can't, we can't stop the hazards, but we can sure minimize the impacts that they have on us. I got two more hours. <laughs> three? Can I hear three? I will stay Sure. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears and talk about North Carolina Baptist Men Disaster Relief. I came into the Carolinas uh, 2005. I, uh, I closed my corporation in D.C., came here, to, uh, I got married, had my first child, and I, came, I chose, my wife and I chose North Carolina to raise our children. Uh, we weren't going to do it in D.C., I can guarantee you that. Um, and that's a whole nother presentation. <laughs> or after a couple beers, right? <laughs> but oh, the stories of DC. Um, but soon after getting here, I, I was recruited uh, by Carl Collins, who's the director or the leader of our safety team. And uh, I met Carl when I was with the school district, um, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And uh, Carl asked me to help get involved uh, and, and serve as um, environmental subject matter expert for the safety team. And I've grown uh, from that role. I've grown into a full member of the safety team and, and, and get out every year and that kind of good stuff. But um, <clears throat> so I've been involved for a while. Not as much as I'd like to be, but I'm getting back more. <coughs> but North Carolina Baptist men, uh, and it's not just men, it's men and women. And when it comes to disaster response, it's not just Baptists. All right, I mean, it's people with big hearts. I mean, I've worked with, through North Carolina Baptist Men, I've worked with doctors. I've worked with people who were a mission, uh, my Sunday school teacher was a missionary who spent uh, 12 years in Africa as a surgeon. Did like literally thousands of operations in Africa as a missionary. 
There's so many good people. And we have somewhere between 12 and 15,000 trained volunteers. These are volunteers that have badges. They're hard badges. They list on the back what disciplines they're trained in. They are photo IDs, right? Part of emergency preparedness is knowing who your people are, by the way, right? If it's an active shooter situation, it's a good idea for your employees to have badges or other situations as well. Um, and I'll talk more about that as, as we get into it. But just as one example of the, the level of work uh, that North Carolina policemen <coughs> do, we served a thousand, and this, I pulled this last night, we served a thousand and one million, fifty-seven thousand hot meals uh, during Florence. And we're still, by the way, we're still cooking meals for, for responders today. Uh, we're not doing the we're not sending out meals to shelters and things like that, but we are still cooking uh, in response to Florence. We did 5,800 recovery jobs. 5,800, okay? That means we rolled up maybe with a skid steer and a crew with a, uh, 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 a trailer full of chainsaws, got, got, went out to somebody's house, cut the tree off it, got it, off, got it out of the way, got it cut up, raked up the yard, left it nice and clean, you know? did some praying, um, uh, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and to do this, we network with various organizations. I'm going to go through a quick rundown of our system. But we do network with uh, American Red Cross, is, right? A lot of times when we're feeding, Red Cross brings the food in, we cook it, and then they'll help distribute it, we'll distribute it. We'll work with uh, Salvation Army. Uh, we have a seat at the emergency management table in Raleigh. When stuff is going down, you'll see a, a Baptist uh, leader uh, uh, to help mobilize and get things rolling. And, uh, okay, let me just keep going here. Now, <clears throat> North Carolina Baptist Men, we do use uh, the ICS system, Incident Command, okay? And we implement our Incident Command routinely. Uh, we have five trainings every year. The state is divided up into ten regions, and we will do the odd number regions one year and the even number regions another year. So we're doing trainings. Uh, we train uh, you know, just hundreds, if not thousands, thousands of people every year in disaster response. Uh, it could be all, all the different disciplines, which I'll talk to a little bit more later. My role will typically be safety officer, whether it's at a training or at a um, live actual event. But we do break it up into ICS. Part of our trainings, we're not just doing the trainings for the students, right, for the volunteers. We're doing the trainings to test our own ICS system, right? And it rotates. It's not the same incident commander every time. Right? It's somebody else. So we rotate who the incident commander is, who plays all the different roles, you know, who's in charge, and who's doing logistics. We rotate it, and we test our system five times a year. Any deployments are in addition to that. I can tell you in Florence we had, I want to say at Florence, I was at New Bern, which was the big one that uh, uh, Roy Cooper and uh, Donald Trump came out to and, and checked out. Um, <laughs> We were there, but we also had 13 more sites. We were running 13 disaster response sites, most of them under incident command, depending how big. Well, all of them, they'll, they'll, we'll have an incident commander. And as you know, ICS can expand or contract depending on the size. This isn't an ICS class. We can talk more about that. But bear in mind, we do follow ICS. And when we plug in with other groups, we fall into ICS within the larger FEMA ICS model. ICS being Incident Command. Now, uh, whether we're going out to a uh, cleanup event, a disaster relief event, or a training, right, we'll have our planning meeting. First planning meeting, we'll sit down. We operate out of churches. We do our trainings at churches. We'll sit down with the local staff. We'll talk about their emergency response plans. We'll, talk, we'll meet with the local fire marshal to discuss uh, what uh, the fire marshal would like to see because basically we're turning a temporary, a, a, a temporary occupancy, a church situation into a housing situation wherever we go. So we have to be worried about fire alarms, uh, smoke alarms, 
where is the electrical, where, where, are the, uh, where, where is the water access, where can we uh, have sewer, sewage access, things like that. When we roll on site, right, so from an administrative standpoint, we have trained people in administration, setting up computers, running computers. How do you, how do, you give people picture badges on site? How do you do these different things? Administration. How do we do the record keeping? Administration. So uh, we've got a command, our command center can get set up either in a mobile command unit or inside the church where of course we'll have full networking set up, completely independent, it could be on the grid or off. We can go anywhere in this country and be on the grid or off. We can have our own electric there, we can have our own water, we can do what we need to do. Two limitations, but we're ready. Um, this uh, is this is actually our, a recovery unit. That semi would be loaded with chainsaws, uh, wheelbarrows, <coughs> shovels, uh, respirators, flashlights, uh, you know, safety gear, all that good stuff. Once our training start, we have an orientation. We give a background on North Carolina Baptist men. We talk about stress management. I've talked a little bit about that in here. Uh, the stages of grief and also our our safety program. Uh, we, you know, we're training people to show up in a disaster area to use chainsaws, do roofs, do all the deal with children, right, who have been traumatized. Uh, we go through all, all, all these things, and you can see the magnitude. Uh, people respond, and you know, there's only one per paid person out of the entire group. We got 12 to 15 thousand volunteers. We got leaders. We got incident commanders. We got doctors. We got uh, kids. Uh, uh, meaning younger people. We got, uh, you know, just people from all walks of life are volunteers and one, there's only one paid person, right? And that, that's just to keep the ball rolling. After orientation, we go into our classroom training. Um, by the way, our EAP, our Emergency Action Plan, is discussed at orientation and it's posted in all the classrooms and it's posted like at the dining hall. It's posted anywhere our students might be. There's an EAP posted at eye level in sight of the direction that they're heading. Um, but we have classroom training. We cover, and these are all different disciplines. First, you go through basic recovery, which is basic, you know, the basics of recovery. But then you can get into more specialized training after, you, after you've been through it. Whether it's administration, logistics, communications, mass feeding, recovery, chaplaincy, child care, laundry, and more. Um, each being a specialized discipline. Folks show up, right? Folks show up at your house and you've got a tree on the house. It'd be nice to know they know how to use that chainsaw, you know? Um, if it's a Baptist men crew that shows up, uh, we're going to have trained volunteers. There might be untrained volunteers with the trained volunteers. We're not turning away people's hearts. We're not going to do that. But if you show up, right, and, and you're not a trained Baptist volunteer, you're going to go, if we assign you a work order, it's going to be with a crew that has a trained and certified crew chief and volunteers that are trained as well. We're not cutting people loose on their own typically. Um, but not only do we talk about how do you use the chainsaws and the PPE of the chainsaws, but we get into the maintenance of them as well. If your chain comes off, how do you deal with your chain? How do you deal, you know, what, what's your fuel mixture? How do you clean it? How do you get it going again? And I just want to point out one of our main chainsaw instructors uh, is a, uh, just a wonderful uh, woman who has been doing this, I, I think, for about 10 years now, providing chainsaw training. We, it's called Baptist Men or Baptist on a Mission, but it's, it's open to everyone. We're not trying to cut off anybody's heart whatsoever. We'll teach roof patch and tarp. You can see uh, one of the fellows <coughs> built a nice simulated roof trailer that we bring on site every class. And we will teach people. You know, you might think, oh, what's, you know, putting a tarp on a roof's not that big a deal. Well, there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. We're teaching them how to do it and how to do it without falling off, right? Fall protection training, right? We're not going to have people working roofs without, without knowing about fall protection and harnesses and anchor points, right? And, you know, just a quick side point. This, 
Baptist men is, is, is really a great model for safety because you know, OSHA doesn't apply to volunteers. OSHA applies to employees. Well, there's only one paid employee in Baptist men, but we still do everything we can to live up to those standards. You know, we do have people come through like the, the chainsaw training who don't like the idea of wearing chaps. If you're gonna use a chainsaw in Baptist men, you're gonna be wearing chaps out there, right? People don't like the idea, you might like wearing your, your golf or your, your, your hat and then you know, put the hard hat over it. Well, when you do that, you eliminate the ANSI rating, right? We don't like that. We train putting walls up and tearing them down, right? First response is usually tearing them down, getting that water out of there, getting the mold out. And uh, <clears throat> again, everybody here, it's their dime. They're here, they have a place to stay. We're gonna feed you. You show up, we're gonna feed you. We're gonna give you a corner of the room, you can put your cot. You'll have a safe place to stay. You'll have good food, it's good food, okay? But uh, nobody's getting paid for this. Mass feeding, there's so many different aspects to setting up a mass feeding operation. But in short, right, you gotta have a crew that knows how to set the kitchen up first off. Man of one, it can produce, I don't know, 30,000 hot meals a day. But it doesn't do that by itself. You gotta have a crew that knows how to set it up, where to set it up, how to get water to it, how to get the waste out of it, sanitation issues, right? Just because we're doing an emergency response kitchen doesn't mean the health department doesn't want to know that we're using clean water. The health department will come out and check us. And we welcome that. We appreciate that. Um, but there's also, of course, serving, cooking, and I did mention sanitation. There's so many things. Here on the left are actual, this is uh, in New Bern, the uh, a line of folks coming in all day long. Cars coming in all day long. No restaurants open, right? Publix or Harris Teeter ain't gonna be open for another week, right? Everything they got's getting trashed anyway. People are hungry and in need, right? So we're cooking all day into the night, serving. Not only is this operation going on, but we're also cooking meals and the Salvation Army might have anywhere from one to 15 Salvation Army trucks sitting off to the side. Well, we'll they'll be taking uh, batches of meals out to shelters to feed people. I mean, think about it. If you can't eat at home and your whole town's been devastated, how are you gonna eat? This is a movie about uh, Man of One that was produced by the History Channel. And uh, it's a short little film. Uh, wish I could share more. There's many, 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 many films from the Pentagon, from Florence, and everything online you can find. But I wanted to share this because it gives you a glimpse of one of the ministries in Baptist Men Disaster Relief that, to just give you an idea of what folks are capable of. In America today, food trucks are all the rage, luring big crowds to these restaurants on wheels. But the ingenious designs of these trucks are finding another, more critical use as well. And on a mega scale. Saturday, August 27, 2011. Hurricane Irene, a powerful storm over 600 miles wide, makes landfall over eastern North Carolina. After hovering over the region for 24 hours, the storm finally turns its way north, leaving devastation in its wake. More than one million people without power in North Carolina alone. Fortunately, there is a solution, at least to the hunger problem. One of the biggest food trucks ever built rolls in to serve meals to the storm's victims. A mega food truck, 40 feet long and eight and a half feet wide, weighing in at a whopping 24,000 pounds. This monster is a transformer on wheels, each side on folds to form deck areas, creating a kitchen space almost 1,000 square feet in size. The back of the truck also folds out and transforms into a hydration deck with a three-compartment sink. At full capacity, the truck can support 60 cooks and serve up to 30,000 meals a day. With the help of support trucks, the mega truck can feed for weeks on end. In preparation for today's crowds, 
Supply trucks hold up to 70,000 pounds of food each, so heavy that one of them actually punched a hole in the pavement. As long as the food count is up, we'll be getting one of these about every other day. Today's meal count, at least 8,000 hungry people. That's almost 12,000 pounds of food. To carry out this gigantic meal, 30 volunteer cooks from a local Baptist group team up with the American Red Cross. The Red Cross brings all the food in, we do the cooking, and they do the serving off most of it. We put a heavy liner in the Cambros, and they feed right out of these Cambros. Is your power been out? Can you kids look this way and give me a big smile? At the heart of this effort is the truck, full of custom equipment, lots of it. Like two roll-in rack ovens, and four convection ovens for meat. It holds 15 trays of 24 patties each. We open the door and roll the whole rack in. This oven over here is our uh, ovens that we slide the pans in. They hold the same amount, but we just slide them in. Total rack count, 54 racks at 24 patties a rack. That's 1,296 meals that can be cooked at one time. It takes 12 to 15 minutes for the patties to cook. So adding another 1,000 meals to the order is a piece of cake. Then there are the two 40-gallon and two 30-gallon capacity tilt skillets to cook items like beans, ravioli, grits, and eggs. The reason it's called a tilt skillet, it tilts over and has a spout on it. You can pour those right into the camera. It's basically like a giant version of your skillet at home. To open so many gallons of food, the cooks rely on two pneumatic can openers. Using suction, each can open up to 12 cans a minute. Still, there are six to eight people doing nothing but opening cans. No deep fryers on here. Healthy food. To power up all those ovens and skillets, the truck is loaded with four 200-gallon tanks of propane, enough to last through two days of cooking. And the whole operation is powered by a mega-sized generator, 45 kilowatts strong. That's enough energy to power up a small town. This kitchen is self-sufficient. We can pull this kitchen in if we have no water, no electricity, or anything. We can set it up and run. Today's mega food trucks can hold tremendous amounts of weight up to 54,000 pounds, and are designed to withstand years of use. That, that gives you an example of, of the type of capability that is actually out there. You know, and feeding, feeding is something we always think about. It's not the only mission, and it's no mission is more important than any other. But, you know, I can tell you, for instance, uh, I've worked closely with uh, our shower mission. We've got trailers set up as portable showers, right? Think about it. Just being able to take a shower after going through something that you don't want to think about right now. Just being able to take a shower. We've got a laundry, right? We've got a laundry ministry. Rolls up, we can do people's laundry for them and do. Can you imagine? Just being able to put on a fresh t-shirt, how important that is under these situations. <coughs> but you know, we also have communications, full spectrum of radios. Our communications unit, you name the radio band, we've got access to it. We're on the, the national emergency response radio frequencies as well. We have our own radios for internal communication. We can shortwave around the world. We have satellite uplink. If you go through the communication training, you're trained how to set up a satellite uplink so we can we can independently uh, communicate via telephone, and also we can like do a whole campus <coughs> of Wi-Fi, right? We can set up our own systems. And again, this is with power out and everything. It's basically in ground zero. We do forklift training. You don't think of get out of here without emphasizing that, right? Right? We don't have y'all aren't showing up and say, "Oh, I can run a forklift. Let me let me grab that stuff out the truck for you." Well, y'all got your certification? Well, yeah. Just about every training location we do, we do forklift training with Baptist men forklifts. 
you know, child care, I've, now I've been through almost all the trainings, and child care was one of the latter ones that I took, and I really wasn't sure, it, it really didn't dawn on me what it would be like, just for example, dealing with kids in a disaster. But, you know, the mindset that they're in, you've got kids coming, maybe mom and dad's going down the river looking for their house, right? Where's the truck? <laughs> and so the kids can stay in a safe, state-licensed child care facility that we set up. We've got everything we need. We're all good to go. Properly trained people, all that good stuff. Proper ratios for anybody that knows about the, the babies to people ratio, all that good stuff. But it never dawned on me, okay, so we got volunteers. What happens if the kid's a buyer? All right. What happens, uh, you know, the, the child's non-responsive. You know, there's a lot of aspects. Dealing with children who have been through a disaster warrants its own training, and we do it. Emergency medical court, right? <clears throat> we have first aid stations with uh, medical professionals, not necessarily doctors, medical professionals at every one of our trainings, most of our response sites, and they, they, they do a good job. Uh, we have folks show up from, you know, from response, it can be anything from slivers, blisters, heat exhaustion, flu, you know. Um, we've had a number of different situations come up, but we also have training for that. Uh, you got to have some level of medical background or at least CPR first aid before that's like a prerequisite for the medical corps. Also have a full-scale hospital that is set up. That's another film we don't have time for, we don't have it lined up. But we've got a full-scale hospital, a mobile hospital that can be set up. It takes a day. We're talking dialysis, uh, x-ray. They can handle all of it, surgery, right? Got a crew specially trained, and it's been mobilized. It has replaced a city that, whose hospital got wiped out by a tornado, had a hospital within days because of this resource that is available um, because of the graces of God. Oh, here we go. So we got bunker units, right? Usually we'll stay in the church, either in the chapel, uh, you know, Sunday school rooms, fellowship hall, what have you. But we've also got bunker units uh, that have been converted into so we can house people. We've got, I mentioned laundry units, right? Uh, so people learn how to set up and get it plumbed and all that good stuff shower units, and uh, <clears throat> all put together by volunteers. Uh, some of the units, uh, the command unit particularly, I believe, some of the units have been donated by like NASCAR drivers. You know, they'll take the, 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 the trailer that takes their cars around from race to race. Maybe he's not racing anymore. They get in it. They'll donate it to us and we'll convert. We'll work with U.S. Foods. A lot of time the food will come out with U.S. Foods. Um, logistics is a big deal. Who's getting what, where, how, and when? Uh, you can see we've got branded and multiple generators, potable water, or systems to create potable water. Uh, when we're talking about emergency preparedness, folks, it can go a lot broader than is the pathway in the stairwell well clear. That's very important, don't get me wrong. Very important, can we get out of here? But there's a lot more going on with preparedness nationally and even right here at home. Um, almost, almost, almost. <laughs> Supplies management. I'll tell you what, when the big ones hit, we got tractor trailers just showing up from who knows where they're coming from. Uh, I remember we got a call in the middle of the night uh, at New Bern, and it's like, yep, yep, tractor's coming in, it's got this, that, and the other thing. It shows up, half of it was for the New Bern site, but the half it was. The tra trailer showed up, everything for us was in front, right? So we had to unload the entire thing and then put back the other app, but you know, every, in the middle of the night, and there wasn't not a gripe out of anybody. They were honored to be out there sweating in the middle of the night. You know, you, you, you talk about supplies, you know, you think about emergency preparedness. We got stuff, we got, think about it. We're gonna be doing 30,000 meals. Think of all the supplies it goes into in the, the paperwork and people keeping it in order and getting it from point A to point B, getting it cooked at the right temperature, getting it served. Wow, we got chainsaws running and we got, we got people getting mud out of basements. There's all this going on. And I just had to put this in here because I had never seen it before. 
Anheuser Busch converted their line and was producing uh, emergency response drinking water. <clears throat> to me, that's brilliant. That's just brilliant. They've already got the cans, they got the wines. What a beautiful investment. That was smart. I mean, I, I love what they did there for a lot of different reasons, from business reasons to uh, it sure was nice to have that drink of water. Um, every training we go to, every site that we set up has an emergency action plan. We keep them simple. At orientation, we will go over the emergency action plan for a given site. Um, all It happens at orientation. It's worked out in advance with our team meetings, and it's posted everywhere. Uh, we talk about tornadoes, fire, emergencies, what have you. We've got horns, we've got intercom systems, all that good stuff. Now, so we welcome all warm-hearted volunteers. It's basically missions offering funded. If you go to church and you've ever heard of the mission offering, that's where most of this money comes from. Although donations help, and uh, a minimal nominal fees for training also help as well. Everybody who gets trained gets a photo ID, a yellow T-shirt, and a hat every time they go through a training. Or we got all kinds of merch. And here's our regions. I can tell you uh, I'm in Region 6. There's a training coming up in Region 6 pretty soon. I'm going to be safety officer at Region 10 uh, out, out towards Murphy <coughs> later, later this spring. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good, good program. If anybody would, would be interested in getting involved, we'd welcome you and love to see you. Um, and I put together just a short list of resources related to this program, whether it's the Safety and Health Council, uh, North Carolina Emergency Management, North Carolina Baptist Men, Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service has a lot of information I've been trained through, and also our Southeast OSHA Training Institute, and more. Uh, that being said, that's pretty much my presentation for this morning. Um, I wanted to cover a little bit about risk management. How do you determine what are you going to be protected for? If you haven't thought through all the different things, Maybe it's a good time to bring it up. If it's not your role, that's okay. You know, talk about it over lunch sometime. The boss might get an idea. Or if you're the boss, hey, maybe you want to form a committee. Um, but think about some of these things. I'm hoping that uh, either the risk management aspects or the disaster response aspects or the Baptist men and women aspects, I'm hoping somehow that this information will better prepare you to be prepared, and I hope all of you will think about sharing some of the information you get here with your friends, family, relatives, folks at work, and uh, you know, hey, the waitress at the bar too, you know, as far as I'm concerned, or waiter, whatever. But <clears throat> emergency preparedness is about all of us. It's about our nation. It's about our families. And uh, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to be part of this group. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brian. You brought a lot of stuff together. And thanks for the work that you do with the Baptist uh, group there. If you're interested in uh, volunteering, what a great use of your expertise uh, put into work uh, very well needed. I'm not so sure that replacing beer with water is a great idea. I don't know. It <laughs> doesn't seem like a good idea. We can debate that. It just went the opposite direction and turned the water into wine. Why don't you change beer into water? That's wrong. Break time, 10.30 back for the next session, okay? And then we got a long period of time for lunch, hour and a half, so. Take a break, See you in a minute. Thank you, sir.
Southern the Baptist is a lot where I have my last name. Chris Thompson is there. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the church. My church is like seven down the road. Okay. I have my last name. Have you been able to get out? Uh, I went down for a match down in Of course, they got the